now. And we're going to start recording the meeting. So you can ignore that unless you don't want to be recorded. I'm not really sure you get a choice, though. <laughs> and as a reminder, we do put these recorded Zooms up on our YouTube channel each week with a list of all the topics that we've covered. So if you ever miss one of these or you remember that Valerie or Ken said something really helpful about a certain topic and you can't remember exactly what it was, you can go through the YouTube videos, look at the contents which are listed under each video and hopefully find the information that you're looking for. So we are gonna jump right in now to some of our content for today. We are gonna start with our COVID-19 updates. So you all know from previous weeks and from following the news, I'm sure that the CDC about a month ago or so updated its mask guidance and recommended that all people, regardless of vaccination status, wear masks when in indoor public spaces. And King County also made a mask directive, which was a recommendation, not a requirement, for the same thing to occur. And that was back on July 26th. Well, yesterday, Snohomish County went a step further than that and is back to mandating masking in all indoor public spaces for everyone age five and over. So that means that in Snohomish County, when you go to the grocery store, or if you go to a restaurant, or if you go to the gym, it's no longer optional. It's not an honor system. It's not unvaccinated people only. Everyone age five and over in any indoor public space in Snohomish County is now required to wear a mask again. Washington State is also strongly encouraging everyone to mask in indoor public spaces, although up to this point so far, the state is still taking the position that it took the last time we went through all of this, which is we're just asking people and encouraging people to do it and we're not mandating it yet. I think we all sort of see what might be coming down the pike here, which is probably a return to a mask mandate statewide at some point. It's anybody's guess as to how quickly that might happen. And we want to remind everybody also that there is a statewide burn ban in effect that currently continues through September 30th. And I'm sure most of you also know that we are scheduled to get some really, really, really hot temperatures through the end of this week. So, you know, water your plants and keep your animals indoors when you can and try to stay cool however you can, but definitely keep in mind that burn ban, the burn ban as well. And the other thing we want to remind everybody about is the Homeowner Assistance Fund. It's part of the American Rescue Plan Act, and it includes assessments as housing costs that are eligible to be paid through the fund. And so if you have people within your communities who are struggling to pay their assessments and you want to provide them with information about resources that can be helpful to them, the Homeowner Assistance Fund might be a good thing to fill them in on, and I'm putting a link into the chat for more information on that. So now that we've moved past most of our usual suspects, we wanna remind everybody that budget season is coming. <laughs> and I'm sure most of you are like, really Valerie, you don't need to remind us of that, we know it. <laughs> Especially those of you managers who deal with budgets for numerous communities at one time. The reason that we wanna remind everybody is that we want you to be checking with your manager and or your association attorney or whatever expert or vendor you use to assist you in putting your budget ratification packet together to make sure that you're providing your owners with the proper disclosures in order to ratify your budgets properly. So one of the things that we have become aware of, and part of why we're aware of this is because we offered a number of months ago to do a complimentary review of associations most recently adopted budget ratification packets is that well over half of them did not actually fully comply with all of the disclosures that are required under Wakaiowa to properly ratify a budget. We'll talk a little bit more about this later in the Zoom with respect to one of the specific disclosures that's required, which is that you're, uh, you have to disclose to your owners the per unit reserve funding surplus or deficiency not an average surplus or deficiency. And we know many of our communities relied on their reserve study professionals to provide them with a disclosure that was consistent with or would be appropriate to use in your budget ratification process. 
And unfortunately, a number of the reserve study companies in our area were providing average surplus or deficiency numbers rather than per unit surplus or deficiency numbers. So this is really just a general reminder that budget season is coming. If you're not familiar with the specifics of what Wakiowa requires to properly ratify a budget, then find somebody to consult with who is familiar with that so that you can make sure you're complying with the list of disclosures that are necessary to ratify your budget. And also, if you're planning on having a manager or your attorney or some other vendor review your budget ratification packet before it goes out to your owners to make sure that it complies with Wakaiowa, make sure you give them enough time to do that so that you still have enough time to send it out with the required amount of notice before your budget ratification process. So don't wait until, you know, two days before you want to mail it and send it to your manager or your attorney in a panic, hoping they can do a real quick turnaround on that review. Ken, did you want to add anything on that topic before I jump into the questions? Well, I would offer it wasn't just a few reserve study professionals that got it wrong. We didn't see a single reserve study professional get it right in the disclosure they provided. And so a lot of the failures were not that the manager didn't try and do it right, or that the board didn't try and do it right is that the professional that they got didn't uh, comply with the statute. And the statute's really clear. And we finally did get one of this, uh, the professionals who had argued with me, I think for four or five months about it. He finally did agree that the statute was clear and provided a very specific method of calculation and that he would change his studies to start uh, complying. So hopefully there will be more, more compliant disclosures this coming year. Hopefully, and for those communities that are already producing as part of your budget ratification process, a spreadsheet, for example, that shows the percentage allocation of each unit within the community and the dues based on those percentage allocations, the monthly assessments, hopefully you can just add another column that calculates the percentage or the specific reserve surplus or deficiency. I don't even know why we say surplus or deficiency. How many of you even have communities or have even heard of a community that has a reserve surplus? I, I'm, I am not an expert on this particular question, but I would venture to guess that 98% of our communities are operating at some sort of deficit, whether it's a big one or a little one. So anyways, you can just add a spreadsheet column that discloses the per unit surplus or deficiency in your reserve funding if you're already creating one of those spreadsheets for the assessments, the monthly assessments anyways. Okay, oh, and we do, sorry, not to keep going back to that topic, we do have a sort of template that at least in terms of listing the categories of information that you need in your budget disclosures, we have a template spreadsheet that we can send you for any community that is not working with professional management or is like, wow, there's a whole new Wakaiowa budget requirement. We didn't even know this. And you know, Wakaiowa has been in an effect for three years, but not everybody knows about Wakaiowa still three years in. So if having that spreadsheet as a point of reference would be helpful because it lists all of the categories of information that you have to include, send an email to info at condolaw.net and we will send you that spreadsheet. So without further ado, we're gonna jump into the questions that we have for today. The first question is this, does the Snohomish County mask mandate apply to common areas within our communities? So as I mentioned earlier, the King County mask directive and the state of Washington so far, those things have only been recommendations where Snohomish County has now made this a requirement. So this is a distinction that's worth noting. As we've shared before, using government guidance and or regulations as a basis or the basis for a board decision on these things is certainly a reasonable thing to do. I also think that we are clearly witnessing a trend back towards masking in indoor public spaces in Washington state. I think it's probably safe to say that until we have a much higher rate of vaccination and or some sort of treatment or a Delta specific vaccine available to us that we're gonna probably continue to see this trend especially because I know it's only the middle of August, right? We're only a third of the way through our last full month of summer, 
but we are moving towards a time of year when people are going to be spending more time indoors and indoors tends to be, of course, a much higher risk in terms of COVID transmission. Ken, go ahead. Well, I was going to say one thing to remember is that this uh, directive applies to public spaces and the condominium and homeowner association common areas do not qualify as public spaces, which means it's still at the full discretion of the board whether or not you want to request uh, masks or not. And yeah. if you're just on burnout about changes, you don't have to change. Uh, so it's really, it, it, it leaves uncertainty for the board still on how best to proceed, but you're, you're not required to mask just because Snohomish County is requiring it for all public spaces. Agreed. And I think that if you, the last two weeks in a row, I believe we've covered this question, albeit without the information that Snohomish County has now released this as a mandate. If you go back to last week's and the week before the, the two Zooms where we covered this, we, we go into detail on the different factors that your board can consider when making this decision, the differences between outdoor common spaces and indoor common spaces and other issues like that. So I don't think we'll go too much further into detail on this one, but if you have follow-up questions, feel free to pop them into the chat. The next question that we received for this week is this, Proclamation 2051 prohibited charging late fees and interest. Did it also prohibit pass-through administrative costs at no markup from the association to the individual owners to send delinquency notices? So the proclamation did not specifically prohibit administrative fees from being passed on to the owners. However, it was very clearly intended to keep penalties from being added to the principal unpaid amounts due on these delinquent accounts. So CLG took the position, and I'll go into detail in a little bit about sort of the general question of whether your particular community can pass on these costs. CLG generally took the position that if there was a service attached to an admin fee and that we could document that service in front of a judge, for example, if we were ever arguing about this in court in the future, that the fee could be passed on to the owner if the fee was reasonable and if the fee was uh, allowed to be passed on under the governing documents for the association. If there was no specific service provided or there was nothing that we could actually document for a court, as I had mentioned earlier, we think the risk associated with passing that admin fee on to the owner is higher. And again, the spirit or the intention behind the proclamation was to limit financial penalties being piled on to people's balance due because of it, you know, the proclamation was instituted to mitigate the financial hardship that people were experiencing as a result of COVID-19. And I think that if I were an attorney, for example, for an owner trying to argue against those fees being added to my client's account, I think part of what I would say to a judge is, Your Honor, it doesn't make a difference if you call it a late fee or if you call it interest or if you call it an admin fee. Adding more dollars to what my client owes when they lost their job due to COVID, right? This is the kind of argument that we are that we are anticipating and, and working to combat when we help our clients make decisions about what fees to pass on to their owners. So the larger question that I would like to address, and I think it's timely to do so because the proclamation is no longer in effect, is whether these types of admin fees can be added to delinquent owner accounts generally. And the things that, the, that your associations all need to keep in mind when making these decisions include the fact that reasonable is the sort of standard by which every association action is measured. So is it reasonable for the board to pass on an admin fee, a delinquency notice fee or whatever to the delinquent owner. Also, you wanna look at whether it's authorized under the governing documents for your association. Governing documents very often contain specific authority to charge late fees and interest on delinquent accounts. The authority to charge other amounts due can be murkier depending on the way the documents are worded. There is limited case law that talks about a management company or an association's ability 
to charge an owner for a service that is provided to the owner. Uh, and some of that case law suggests that if there's a service being provided to the owner, that, that, that charging them for it is, is not unreasonable. However, none of those cases are specific to delinquency related charges. So they're all for things like, you know, document fees when somebody purchases a home within a community or, Ken, what was the other one about the docs that we were talking about earlier today? Well, one of the cases was about the transfer fee, which many management companies charge to new purchasers when they uh, update their documents. Um, I think there's, you know, some management companies have begun charging a fee for inspecting a condominium unit at the time a resale certificate is being prepared. So there's a, a variety of different fees which management companies may want to charge to individual owners. So the question I think really comes down to, well, number one, in light of that case law, is there a service being provided to the owner? On the one hand, delinquency notice does notify the owner of their balance due. On the other hand, that really is more of a service to the association, I think, than it is to the owner. It also depends, I think, on the amount of the admin fee or the delinquency notice fee. We've seen them as low as $10 per month and as high as $35 or $50 per month. And I think the amount definitely matters. I also think that it matters how big the balance due on the account is generally. So if you're adding $50 a month in admin fees on a balance due that's, you know, 250 bucks, that's a much harder sell in front of a judge than $10 monthly admin fees or $15 monthly admin fees in particular when the balance due is larger. So I think the bottom line here is this. Don't assume that these fees are automatically able to be charged to your owners. Consult with your association attorney who can look at your governing documents and the amount of the fees and whatever service may or may not be included with those fees. So they can advise you specifically for your community if those fees can be passed on to your owners. And also I wanna remind everybody that we're talking about the association's ability to assess these fees to a delinquent owner. The question of whether your management company has the ability to charge the association for those services and fees is governed by the management contract and is a completely separate question. So Ken, did you wanna add anything more on that before I keep moving? Yeah, I, I personally think there's a difference between a monthly admin fee for a delinquent account and a fee for sending a letter to an owner for a delinquent account. I could argue that there's a service provided when you send a letter a lot better than I could argue that there's a service provided just because a delinquency report was uh, kicked out of an accounting system. I agree wholeheartedly with that. Okay, we have a somewhat related question that just came in on the chat. And it says, I know we cannot go for a foreclosure on fines or late fees, but can we still get a judgment on these balances? What is the accepted procedure? So the, um, the question is referring to the new restrictions under House Bill 1482, which requires that certain amount, a certain threshold amount be met before you can proceed with a foreclosure lawsuit against a delinquent homeowner. And those threshold amounts have to be calculated based on the unpaid assessments alone. In other words, you can't include fines and late fees and attorney's fees and interest charges to more quickly meet that threshold amount due in order to proceed with a foreclosure lawsuit. So if you have an owner who is paying their monthly assessments on time, but has accumulated a balance due because of unpaid violation fines and maybe late fees on those fines, for example, uh, certainly there are options for enforcement on that balance due, but I think that you would need to consult with your association attorney for advice on how best to proceed for a lot of reasons. One is you want to look at what your governing documents say about this kind of stuff. And the other is that you want your attorney to make sure that you have complied with both your fine policy as well as the statutes in levying those fines. In other words, you want to make sure the fines are actually valid before you jump into any litigation over them. I think certainly uh, it is possible to file an enforcement lawsuit and also ask the court for a judgment in the amount of those unpaid fines. 
It might also be possible to ask for an award of attorney's fees if the court finds that the fines fines or holds, excuse me, that the fines are proper and valid. You definitely can't file a foreclosure lawsuit right out of the gate for those things, but getting a personal judgment is or may still be an option depending on the particular circumstances that you're dealing with. Did you want to add to that, Ken? Well, actually, I would ask you whether or not you could use small claims court to get that judgment instead of having to use an attorney. Yes, I think you can. So the things to keep in mind about small claims court include that there is a jurisdictional limit, and I believe it's $5,000, if I'm remembering that correctly. So if the amount due in question is $5,000 or less, and if the only thing you're asking the court to do is enter a monetary judgment against the owner, then small claims court may be an option for you. You cannot have the uh, an attorney represent you in small claims court unless you file a motion asking the court to allow it. And it's at the discretion of the small claims judge whether or not to allow that. So this is the kind of thing where the board or the manager would secure the small claims court packet from the district court in whatever county where you're located and would complete all of the paperwork and the steps in the packet and get it filed and then get it served on the homeowner. And then somebody, either a board member or the manager would have to show up in court on the date of the hearing on that small claims matter and present evidence to the court to support the association's right to that judgment in that amount or whatever amount that you're requesting. So you can have an attorney help you with the paperwork if you think that makes the process a little bit more easy. But primarily, this has to be driven or handled by the manager or the board, and small claims court certainly is an option. Once you have a judgment in small claims court, you can have your attorney file it in the superior court of that county, and it can be used to garnish wages and bank accounts, provided that the COVID-related restrictions uh, right now make bank account garnishment a little bit trickier. So hopefully that answers your question. I'm gonna keep moving through the questions that we have for today. Uh, the next one is this, RCW 6490, which is Wakiowa, in its entirety applies to all communities created after July 1st, 2018 or later, assuming that plat is 13 or more units and does not have annual assessments that exceed $300 per lot or unit. Is this statement correct? Thank you. Uh, yes, the short answer is this statement is correct. So the, the section of the RCWs that's, that we're talking about here is RCW 6490075. And I just put that citation into the chat. It's not a link, but if you just Google that RCW, it'll take you to the section in question. And what this section says is that all common interest communities created on or after July 1st, 2018 are subject to Wakaiowa except a plat or miscellaneous community that's not subject to any development right, if it contains no more than 12 units, and if it is reasonably anticipated that the average annual assessment per unit will be $300 or less. In those cases, it's the only sections of Wakaiowa that apply to that community are RCW 6490, um, 020, 025, and 030. The other exception that's worth noting is that if you've got subsequent phases of developments that were created under previous statutes before July 1st, 2018, then adding additional phases to those pre Wakaiowa communities does not subject those communities or those phases to Wakaiowa. So if you started creating a condominium under or an HOA under either the Condo Act or the HOA Act before Wakaiowa took effect. And the declaration provides for adding subsequent phases and you're adding a subsequent phase, then that phase, that community remains governed by the statute that it was originally formed under. Did you wanna add anything to that, Ken? No, I'm good. Okay, I am going to keep moving. The next question says, we have a board of directors that has problems getting homeowners to attend meetings and they want to change their governing documents to reduce their quorum to just needing 60% of whoever attended that specific meeting to make decisions. So the members in attendance will be the ones making decisions. So I think that I actually kind of misread this question initially 
because the way I read the question initially was whether reducing the quorum requirement would be a reasonable step. And the answer to that is that certainly a community has the ability to amend their governing documents to reduce the percentage of owners who need to be present in person or by proxy at a meeting in order to make quorum. 60% um, is not even close to the lowest quorum that we've seen. We've seen communities that have, I think in HOAs, Ken mentioned having seen one as low as 10%. I've seen them as low as 15%. <clears throat> Under the Mutual and Miscellaneous Corporations Act, which is RCW 2406, the minimum quorum requirement is 25%. Under the HOA Act, it's 34%. And under, is that right, Ken, 34%? The default under the HOA Act, if the quorum the is not described, is 34%. <laughs> Thank and you. And the default under Ukiowa is 20%. But so, if you are governed by 2406, you cannot have a smaller quorum than 25%. And the difference between a minimum as stated under 2406 and a default is that with a default, you can have a lower quorum if your governing documents specify a lower quorum. But under the Mutual and Miscellaneous Corporations Act, you cannot go lower than 25% because that's the minimum stated under that uh, Nonprofit Corporations Act. So in order to change your quorum requirement, you need to follow whatever amendment procedures apply to the document that contains your quorum requirement. So if it's in your declaration, you need to amend the declaration, which will require a vote of your owners. If your quorum requirement is in your bylaws, some bylaws require a vote of the owners to be amended, others do not. Others can be amended simply by a vote of the board members. Um, you need to check your articles of incorporation to make sure there's nothing in those that trumps or dis, um, sorry contradicts the bylaws because if there's a conflict between those two, the articles of incorporation will control. Also, ideally, your articles of incorporation will tell you which of the two nonprofit corporations acts your community is formed under. Most of our clients, I would venture to guess, I don't know, 70 or 80% of them are probably created under 2403, which is not the one that we just mentioned with the 25% minimum, but a handful of them are incorporated under 2406, and so that minimum quorum requirement would apply. So now that I reread the question and realized that I, I kind of read it wrong, the, the question really is they want to change their governing documents to only need 60% of whoever attended the meeting in order to, to make certain decisions. That is changing the percentage vote required to take certain actions. Actually, I think what it is, Valerie, is ahead. can they just eliminate their quorum requirement entirely oh. and then require a supermajority of the people who show up to amend the documents? Okay, that's a fair reading too. What do you think the answer is, Ken? I think that they cannot eliminate the quorum requirement. I agree. So whoever I'm, I'm seeing that the person, I'm not sure that the person who submitted this question is here today. If you are, and if we are completely reading the question wrong and you wanna clarify, feel free to put some more information in the chat for us. But hopefully one or the other of us has answered the question with our meanderings there. <laughs> All right, our next question is this. When a community does not have an adequate number of board members consistent with their governing documents, what is your recommendation or best practice on the proper steps for business to be conducted or a decision to be made? Can the board, if there's only one board member, for example, can that board member provide direction and still make decisions up to a point, up until additional board members join, if that ever even happens? And there's a lot more detail in the question, but I think we've all, been aware of or had contact with communities where it is really, really hard to seat a full board or even to replace a single board member when somebody sells their home or just decides that they're done serving on the board. The good news is that if you have less than a full board, you can still do business on behalf of your community. We do have, and Ken just mentioned, I think somebody that called him either this week or last week who was convinced that unless they had the three board members required by their governing documents, they just couldn't do anything. They couldn't do any business for their association that it was three board members or nothing could happen. Is that an accurate representation of the phone call that you had, Ken? Yes. Okay, so the good news is that that person is wrong. 
you can still still do business on behalf of your community if you don't have a full board. So there are some things that kind of either increase or decrease the risk, right? If you're making a really controversial decision, such as adopting a $5 million special assessment or something that your owners are highly likely to challenge, even if you do have a full board, then perhaps there's an additional risk in only having one board member making that decision, right? If your community is professionally managed and you're getting competent advice from your manager, from uh, project managers, from your association attorney, that mitigates the risk that people will be able to successfully challenge board decisions based on having a reduced number of board members. So how involved the board member is in the day-to-day -day business of the community also makes a difference. So if you're in a community that has professional management, you probably aren't terribly involved in the day-to-day, -day, right? You're not the one that's sending the delinquency notices. You're not the one that's depositing the checks. You're not the one that's doing all the work of sort of running this business from a day-to-day -day perspective. On the flip side, if you're in a self-managed community, the risk is higher and the calculus is just different because you can't, for example, if you've got one board member, they can't be both the president and the treasurer. And so if you are working with a community that has one board member only and it's a self-managed community, that board member's primary duty or order of business should probably be doing whatever they can to find another board member to serve with them, followed very closely by seriously considering professional management because of the risk associated with a one board member self-managed scenario. So, and don't forget that in almost all communities, if you have, if you're down a board member or down two board members, as long as you've got one board member that is still serving on the board, that board member in most communities can appoint other owners to serve or fill the vacant positions until the next time that you have an election. So those are all ideas and thoughts about this type of situation. If you wanna follow up with additional comments or clarification in the chat, feel free to do that. And Ken, if you have anything you wanna to add to that, now would be a good time. No, nope, I'm good. Okay, I, there's one other question from the chat that kind of relates back to something that we talked about last week. When we had somebody that asked a question about sol solar panels and whether we have a lot of communities amending their documents to uh, reflect the restrictions on communities' abilities to restrict solar panels within their, within their uh, communities. So the person said that I think my wording was confusing. From what you've seen, have many HOAs been updating their governing documents to implement some or all of the restrictions allowed by the RCWs? Also, sometimes has it been sufficient to do this through resolutions versus amending the covenants? I think this was your question last week, Ken. I don't know if you want to run with this one. Well, I, I can try. The, I'm a little confused by the question because what the statute does is basically say the legislature doesn't care what restrictions there are in an HOA's governing documents. And this is not condos, but HOA's. People still get to put in solar panels as they are you know, described in the statute. And so you don't need to update your governing documents to allow the uh, solar panels. You don't need to update your governing documents to limit a solar panel installation to what the statute says. So I would say every time we update a set of HOA governing documents, we do provide the statutory language about solar panels because it just seems to make sense to us to do that. But the, you know, the, the way the question's written is, are you, are we adding in restrictions on solar panels? And the answer is no, because the statute does not create restrictions on solar panels. It creates restrictions on an, a board's ability to prohibit solar panels. I think it's on to the rest of your questions now, Ken. And, and for the person that submitted that question, if, if we're still not getting it, it might just be because this context isn't the best for a more in-depth discussion of this topic. But reach out to your association attorney if you're looking for a recommendation about what to do with your governing documents. 
based on those statutory restrictions. And I'm gonna let Ken take it away with the rest of your questions. All right, so my first question is, can board members vote by proxy at board meetings? And in other words, can they give their vote to either another board member or a person who comes and stands in their place at the meeting? And the answer is no, they cannot vote by proxy. Under Ukiowa, it's very specific that uh, proxies are not allowed for board members. I can tell you that under Robert's Rules of Order, it's fairly specific that proxies cannot be used by board members. It is not possible for a board member to meet their duty of care under the statute to make an informed decision if they have given their vote to another person, whether that person is a board member or not. So. Uh, we take the position that there cannot be any form of proxy for a board decision. Either a board member is present in person or by phone, and they're participating in the discussion, and they are making an informed decision and casting a vote, or they do not vote because they are absent. And uh, if you need to have a decision, then you can call a special board meeting, the, uh, you know, Try and accommodate some way for a board member to participate, but you cannot simply give a proxy from one board member to another. Uh, my second question is sort of related to what we talked about a little earlier on why do we have to show a deficit or surplus for every unit in our budget proposals when we go to ratify the budget? And the short answer is because the re statute requires it. And the, uh, the longer answer is that the legislature still has this false belief that if owners understood how poorly funded their reserves were, they would demand that boards increase their dues in order to have money for future expenditures. Of course, we know in the real world that doesn't happen, but the statute does require that owners be informed. And this is a sort of a broad sweeping attempt to avoid surprises when owners are told they have to make a large special assessment. This is true in the, excuse me. It's true in resale certificates where you're trying to make sure potential buyers understand how the reserves compare to future expenses. It's true at every budget cycle in terms of helping the owners understand how well or poorly the budget they are being asked to approve is gonna take care of future expenses for them. You know, between 2012 and 2018, there was this long list of eight different things you were supposed to disclose to uh, your condo owners or HOA members as part of the budget process to help them understand the reserve adequacy. It included things like a list of all the special assessments that were going to come up in the next five years, a list of any year that you weren't fully funded for the next 30. It was a lot of work and a lot of effort. And so when UKIO was adopted, the legislature simplified that and basically got it down to a single number, which is what this deficit is related to the fully funded balance calculated by the professional. And it's a relatively simple piece of math. I think it does over represent what the true needs of the community are, but it's still a measure which is recognized, understood by uh, you know, at least a large percentage of the people within the community association world. And so it's something which, you know, if, if you don't understand how to calculate it, I'm happy to help. It is stated in RCW 6490550 exactly how to calculate it. And so we believe you need to put that in every budget that you ratify. Um, the other questions I've got are also going to be reserve study related. The first one is the reserve study says that the cost of maintaining limited common elements is an owner expense. And so the reserve study professional removed all the costs associated with the uh, deck 
and uh, structural maintenance of those decks from the reserve study. And one of the owners has challenged the reserve study because they don't want to be responsible for the deck repairs. So the first thing I'll offer is that the reserve study professional is not competent to tell you whether or not a particular expense belongs to the association or to an individual owner or a group of owners. I think that you should be talking to your attorney about interpreting the declaration, not to your reserve study professional. And I can tell you that a lot of uh, limited common areas and especially things like decks have very poorly defined boundaries. And so it is very common for associations or individual uh, members of the association to assume that uh, deck means the structure of the building. When the deck may just mean a block of air that the owner gets to use situated on top of a structure, which is called a deck. So if your reserve study professional is being asked to make decisions about what to include, then you're likely to get errors. And the, uh, the solution is to consult with the attorney to determine what is or is not part of the reserve study expenditures. Certainly with uh, condominiums where windows and doors are limited common elements, it's possible that all those expenses are shifted to individual owners and therefore fall out of the reserve study. It's also possible that they're common expenses and belong in the reserve study. And it, it's a big dollar difference. And so it's relevant to, and important to find out exactly how it should be allocated. The second question is that uh, an owner has, or a board has determined that the reserve study includes a big expenditure, which the association is just not going to do. And they, the board had all these reasons why they're not going to do it or why it shouldn't be in the reserve study, but it is in the reserve study. And in this you know, particular client, it was a million dollar item for a 25 unit condominium. So $40,000 a unit difference. And the reserve study professional had said that this needed to be repaired next year. So we're talking a, a fairly large expenditure. And so the, you know, the board's arguing, well, we, we're just going to ignore that. And so they did not want to provide the deficit, which was calculated by the reserve study professional with their budget. So, you know, if you, believe your reserve study professional is inappropriately including or excluding items, then the solution is to get a different reserve study professional and make sure that they understand what it is you are actually responsible for. You may need to involve your attorney or manager to help clarify that. You may even wanna have construction professionals like architects or engineers or contractors help you determine what the true costs might be so that you are more accurately reflecting the future needs of the association. But if all you have is a reserve study that shows that million dollar item, that is the document which you have to rely on and provide to your owners and use to update your budget. Until you get a different reserve study, that's the one you've got. And it's kind of like until you amend your declaration, you work with the one that you have. Okay. And so there are a lot of problems that associations have that you can fix by amending your documents to get a different result or by getting a, a correct assessment for your reserves or getting a correct legal opinion. But you need to take those steps. You can't just as a board or as an individual owner decide, I disagree with this professional, so I'm going to just completely discard and disregard that advice. We do have some clients who will disclose that they have a reserve study that they believe is wrong. They will provide it as written by the reserve study professional, and they will give an explanation of why they think it's wrong. I'm okay with that because you are giving the full amount of information to the owner or the buyer who's looking to purchase, 
and you can let them evaluate the information on their own, that eliminates the risk that you have you know, withheld information from your board or from your members or from the purchaser. So that's what I've got for today. Did you have anything else come in the chat, Valerie? Yes, we have one other question from the chat. So now's your last chance. If you guys have questions to pop them in the chat, please. The question is this, with the increased need for privacy, is there any legal requirement that owner contact info has to be shared with other owners? So I'm gonna take a stab at this and then let Ken fill in what I, what I, am, what I miss. Um, I'm not really sure what, what the increased need for privacy means. I think probably the reference is to how, how easy it is to get information on just about anything and anybody on the internet these days and people's corresponding desire to protect their privacy. But none of that really has changed what the obligation of the association is when it comes to disclosing owner contact information, with some exceptions. So the association is not obligated to uh, you know, proactively provide a list of every single homeowner and their mailing address and their phone number and their email address to any owner who asks, right? The context I think is really more when an owner requests the ability to review the association's records as they have the right to do under Washington state statutes. Then the question becomes, what do they get to review when it comes to owner information and contact information? And I think it's very clear that your owners have the right to review uh, information that would include a list of all of the owners within your community and their mailing addresses and their address within the community, because sometimes those two things are different. We have told our clients for the most part that if people have an unlisted phone number and, and or their email address can be treated as an unlisted phone number, right? That email addresses do not have to be disclosed. I do believe there was recently a case out of California, Ken, you can correct me if I'm wrong, where the court said that under their governing statute, the association did have to disclose email addresses for their owners, but there isn't a corresponding case in Washington state that requires that. Is, am I remembering that correct, Ken? I don't remember if it was California, but you are correct that an appellate court held that the email addresses were a record of the association, which the association's board was required to give to an owner who requested it. We have been fighting that as a legal conclusion in Washington state for our clients. We have not had it challenged in court yet. Um, we've, I think actually have a chapter in our book about privacy. And there are, you know, I'd say good legal arguments that there are protections of private information and because the statute, like the, um, the Condominium Act and the HOA Act were enacted before email was a thing, that uh, we believe the legislature would treat an email address the same as an unlisted phone number. And so uh, we've you know, been successful in our, we'll say, battles with other attorneys in keeping this as a, a valid legal argument. It just hasn't been through the court yet. Uh, and the, you know, I think Ukiowa does specify that you don't have to give out email addresses. And so we have been adopting language as we rewrite uh, declarations for our clients to include a very specific disclaimer that that is not an association record. We can't be sure it's gonna hold up in court but it certainly is going to be better than if there's nothing in the declaration to describe what a, uh, an email would mean. So I think the short answer is your owners have the right to review the association's records, which at a minimum would include the name of each owner, the unit or lot address that they own, and their offsite mailing address if they have one. And where we generally fall on the question of whether you have to share phone numbers and email addresses is that you do not have to share that information. Hopefully that answers your question. And I don't see any more in the chat. So unless somebody puts one in there real quick, I think we might be done for the day. Going once, going twice. All right, everybody have a great week. Try to stay cool and we will see you here next week. Bye.